Before we begin, we'd like to introduce you to your engagement tools. You can use these throughout the webinar to customize your view. Located at the bottom of the screen, clicking on these is how you can toggle between watching the video presentation, viewing the slide presentation, submitting a question, joining the group chat, or learning more about the event. Once you've made your selection, you can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. For the best viewing experience, we recommend adjusting your screen zoom to 90%. Clicking on the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen can provide answers to some common technical issues. If your slides are running behind the speaker, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A tool. We will do our best to answer during the webcast, but if you need a more comprehensive answer or we run out of time, we'll make sure to respond after the broadcast via email. If you'd like to download today's slide deck or any additional materials, you can access these by clicking the resource list at the bottom of the screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the live webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Lastly, we encourage you to complete the survey during or after the webinar. We'd love to hear your thoughts so we can continue to improve our digital event experience. Thank you for joining us. You need to be modern, responsive to meet your mission and deliver for citizens and workers fast. So what stands in your way? A world of complexity, and your technology is holding you back when it should be taking you forward. Pega's intelligent automation software is the low-risk way to deliver real outcomes. We've helped government agencies boost efficiency by 87%. We offer speed, flexibility, and technology built to renew your existing systems without disrupting critical day-to-day -day operations. With our unified platform, you can modernize your legacy systems one journey at a time. Bring multiple systems together for better visibility and higher accountability. Use advanced automation and robotics to streamline processes and adapt to change. Concentrate on the work that matters by simplifying how the rest gets done. the modernization puzzle and join the list of government agencies who have worked with us to upgrade their business and technology strategy to be more resilient today and stronger tomorrow. Start crushing complexity with PEGA today. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for being uh, here today on International Women's Day. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the country we're on and recognise the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. Uh, for my uh, purposes, that's the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. Um, thanks to PEGA Systems for making this event happen today. Um, hashtag is uh, hash PEGA gov, P-E-G-A, G-O-V. Um, please uh, use that. Um, Looking for questions from the audience uh, as the uh, the event progresses, uh, and particularly uh, for the panel, um, please use the chat system. Um, and start off by using the uh, the group chat to introduce yourself and, and say where you are from. Um, it's uh, I believe it's the first evolved government event um, in uh, in Asia Pac, so um, there's going to be people from all over the uh, all over the region. It's an exciting time to be in government. Uh, we've faced some of the most serious issues for government and indeed our society in generations and are slowly coming out of those dark days. We now have time to turn our mind to the future and how we can improve government services and the citizen experience. My background is a, a career technology uh, guy. If you've uh, seen my LinkedIn profile, then you already know that I spent a number of years in the Northern Territory 
uh, prior to moving to South Australia. As the CIO for the Department of Primary Industries and Resources, I spent about half my time outside the Darwin office, roaming around the cattle stations and other farms of the top end in Central Australia. I spent my time talking with cattlemen, staff and researchers. I listened a lot and asked lots of questions to try and help identify the root causes of some of the problems they faced. It was this travelling around that showed me how precarious communications are there and, and indeed across remote Australia. Stepping outside the main centres, such as Darwin, Catherine or Alice Springs, and you have no services. There's no phone services, nothing. Um, working with a startup from Wagga in New South Wales, uh, my office and, and the NBN, we devised, uh, tested and deployed a solution for the last mile conundrum for people living there. Um, if you come from an infrastructure and network background like me, um, then you'll understand how complicated broadband over a Wi-Fi network that is meshed, wake on demand and solar powered can be. Um, it, it still makes my head hurt. Um, but it also changed lives on remote stations. A little closer back towards civilization, well, closer to Darwin anyway, was a project that came about after a post-meeting corridor conversation, and we've all had those, with a fisheries researcher. Anyway, to make a short story really long, or actually a long story really short, apparently Darwin Harbour is a little scary for scuba divers. Um, they pull about 300 crocodiles a year uh, out of the harbour um, and they're removed and, and taken off to, uh, to farms. Um, so I guess the crocodiles have something to do with it. But anyway, after 12 months worth of effort, um, working with uh, Northern Territory Fisheries and Microsoft, we devised an AI model to help count fish um, and mean, meant that we didn't need to put divers into the water. Um, this has gone on to be used by other fisheries uh, globally um, and is a leading world first AI project. So the point of that was that these projects are the result of great working relationships with my customers and the removal of verticals and all of the accoutrement of organisations that mean problems don't actually get solved. Getting to understand your customer is uh, key. I'll also let you into one of my little habits, um, and that's my not using a slide deck today. It forces people to actually listen to what is being said um, rather than reading a slide. Um, it's not, not listening, not in an effort to prepare a response, but to actively listen and learn. The better you understand your customer, the better your responses will be. The better your responses are, the more likely the engagement will improve and be more productive over time. The better your engagement with your customers, the more likely you will be, you will learn what their actual pain points are rather than what you think they are. Um, it takes much of the guesswork out of your conversations with them. The challenge for everyone is knowing where to start. Stephen Covey wrote, um, I believe in the, in the uh, mid-1980s, to begin with the end in mind. This guidance has proven valuable over many years, never losing sight of a strategy, the why we are doing what we're doing. In just about every project that a business does these days, in government or private industry, the talk is all about customer experience. And ironically, often that is not even actually customer focused at all. Think about the project work going on in your organisation right now, today. How many are described as implementing a new CRM um, or implementing a new ABC platform? Perhaps enabling our customers through a new app. What we're really doing is adding to our departments and our government's complexity. We're putting layers on layers. A truly customer-centric architecture starts in the centre with your customer. More importantly, it starts with the outcomes that that customer is trying to achieve. And by starting in the centre and working out, you're then able to have a common journey that runs across all your channels. So your customer gets a consistent experience. We'll hear much more about that approach as this event goes on. Lastly, um, ensure the changes that you bring are lasting and sustainable. Um, it's about creating new environments and new journeys, not just wallpapering over the old ones. Anyway, that's enough from me for today. Um, feel free to reach out to me directly um, uh, through PSN or through LinkedIn um, and ask any questions you have as the event goes on. That would be fantastic. Now I'd like to introduce Luke McCormack, uh, Vice President, Managing Director, APAC uh, Pegasystems, and Rob Bollard, Director, Industry Pin a Principal at Pegasystems. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's event.
Thank you, Rowan. It's great to be here today, coming to you from our Sydney office. Welcome to our inaugural Evolve for Government Asia Pacific, an event that we've run around the world previously and now bringing it to you live here in Asia Pacific. First of all, on behalf of PEGA, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the place we now call Sydney. And we acknowledge their continued connection to country. We pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past, present and emerging. It's great to see people joining us from both Australia and New Zealand, but also Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, all around the region. I'd like to welcome everyone. We have a great lineup for you today with some really inspirational stories of digital transformation across multiple jurisdictions and they're driving real impact in the community. Here at PEGA, we realise that uh, doing business isn't always that simple, but our job is to make it feel simple. Our technology is designed to crush complexity, the complexity that you face in your day-to-day -day world. Perhaps that's getting more out of your legacy systems, automating manual tasks for your back office staff, creating citizen-centric journeys, or enabling paths to resolution faster. With our unified platform, you too can modernise those legacy systems one journey at a time. Bring multiple systems together for better visibility and higher accountability. So as you sit back and enjoy today's presentations, I'd like to charge you with one thought. Don't let your legacy technology hold you back. Discover how low risk, a low risk way to deliver real outcomes, not just to citizens, but also to your staff. Now more than ever, we need to modernise and be responsive to meet your mission and deliver for your citizens and your workers fast. So with that, let's get started. I'm really excited to introduce Rob Bollard. Rob is our new industry principal for public sector across Asia Pacific. Rob is very well known to the PEGA community and to many of you at this event, but maybe from a different standpoint. You see, Rob joined us late last year, having led a range of business, customer and technical transformations over his distinguished 30 year career across federal, state and local government. Rob brings with him a very unique perspective. He knows the challenges and missions you're facing. He knows the importance of driving value and minimising risk. So Rob, COVID-19, it's been the scourge uh, of the planet for the last 12 months, uh, but it's also provided a once in a century opportunity for public sector uh, to modernise and transform the way they deliver services. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on the opportunities that organisations have to thrive in this new normal. Great. Look, thanks, Luke, and it's a real pleasure to have joined PEGA. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. Look, you mentioned complexity, and look, having led from the inside and on many major transformation programs, I can tell you that reducing complexity is the number one challenge uh, going for government. Government has been historically siloed with old complex legacy government systems, business processes, and they, look, they increase the cost, the risk, and they challenge smooth service delivery. There are three distinct threads that I want to talk to everybody about today, and it's all about proactive customer service, the power of digital platforms, and building for connected outcomes. So Luke, the first is a radical rethink of customer engagement from reactive to proactive and even preemptive. Government leaders have recognised that digital customer service is uh, it's the heart of success in delivering outstanding public sector outcomes. And look, you know, CX isn't easy. It's very challenging having been through the journey within government. And the bar is being raised exponentially through the service experience from citizens generally. Think of it uh, in terms of ordering a pizza or going to the bank or organising your next accommodation. Citizens are judging government services on the experience they're having with the private sector. And you know, re the research shows that citizens expect the same level of uh, response from the government as they would get from the private sector. Yep. So look, governments are looking to reimagine and benefit from you know, how digital can be used to enhance the citizens' end-to-end -end experience of public services. You know, as McKinsey Research found, good experiences can boost citizens' outcomes. And look, they build engagement and trust, but they also drive down costs through smoother operations. So it's not a one or other, it drives both of those. And that's certainly the experience that I've had in my digital transformation journey. 
More importantly, look, they can deliver against the four pillars of good customer service, demonstrate empathy, support staff, reduce cost and foster relationships. Now, according to Mary Meeker, you know, citizens are now spending approximately six hours of their day on digital medium, and over half of that is using mobile devices. And the convenience level that we're seeing through digital channels is now driving 80% of consumer contact through those digital channels. And customers are expecting that seamless interaction regardless of what channel they come through. And that's being accelerated through the COVID process as well. So in terms of trends, we believe customer service is built on two core components. The ability to have real-time insight about your customer's needs and actions that will drive the best value for your customer and the organisation. The second thing is end-to-end -end automation muscle. So that once you've made uh, that decision around the action that you need to take, you can complete it in a way that is both easy for the customer but also efficient for the organisation itself. And that's the secret source of PEGA, really, is that ability to combine real-time decision-making, case management and orchestration to deliver real value for customers. So, look, as you're aware, Luke, you know, we're really proud of the global best-in-breed customer service capability that we have. You know, one that's really supporting leading service organisations globally uh, across all industries, uh, especially where complexity is the norm. So look, you know, again, we are blessed to have such great customers like, for instance, American Express, the company that in a lot of respects defined great customer service. They use PEGA as their customer service desktop globally. Uh, and also organisations like Verizon in one of the most violent uh, verticals on the planet in telecommunications. They use PEGA to engage with their customers and drive work to done. So, you know, we, we know what, what it takes to be successful in this space. Terrific. Uh, absolutely. Look, exactly. Like the Commonwealth Bank, which uses PEGA capability to identify what they call the next best conversation for each customer across all their channels. 24 million next best conversations in real time de you know, decisioning, which includes 250 million real time personalised messages to support customers during COVID, as well as developing the great webinar that you did, Luke, where you know, they expressed around their benefits finder, which has been accessed over 500,000 times, that identifies 269 benefits that their customers were eligible for. And then they delivered personalised messages, which has put an estimated $153 million back into the po their pockets at a time of need. You know, imagine this ca capability unleashed on citizens through a similar connected government experience. Not only that, during COVID, right, when public sector was really trying to support society and what the Commonwealth Bank did is really underpin how that was brought to their customers. Absolutely. So secondly, Luke, uh, you know, the public sector you know, organisations are realising the power of digital platforms. Their platforms are architected for micro journeys, agility, repeatability and change, leveraging what we call groundbreaking centre out business architecture. They're designed for open ecosystems and they're really uh, platforms that crush complexity by being able to weave together different technologies, anything from mainframe all the way through to cloud based AI. And that's an incredible opportunity for organisations to drive their transformation programs and also to drive employee experiences that are streamlined and, and seamless. These platforms are becoming supercharged by what we call hyper -auto automation, using AI, uh, RPA, BPM and advanced machine learning to automate and simplify work and radically transform uh, delivery models moving forward for the government. We also see the power of these digital platforms at a whole of government level by seeking to address the somewhat fragmented IT landscape, reduce cost and duplication and drive speed to delivery for common challenges across government. Finally, forward thinking agencies are transforming from siloed approaches to operating as a service, being able to deliver seamless and frictionless citizen outcomes end to end in what is commonly known as life events. These can be focused on a particular challenge and, and the one that I always use, Luke, is around you know, thinking of veteran care, which could be delivered through an orchestrated and connected case management approach across the service ecosystem. So you're moving from a siloed approach to really becoming multi-service, centred around the veteran's well-being. 
where proactive financial, healthcare and other support could be made and optimised optimize for their particular circumstances. Or more broadly, across what we call life events. For example, as we pivot later this year from a medical emergency to an economic recovery, it's an excellent opportunity for government to orchestrate maybe a seamless approach for starting a business. One that could not just weave together government and private sector interactions into the journey of a new business owner, yep. but also mash up both transactional and informational assets to support small business. There's already fantastic progress that's being made at a federal and state uh, level, and we're going to be hearing from Minister yep. Dom Dominello uh, just after this. Um, so there is a lot of momentum currently. And so, for example, with the help from the PEGA platform, DPIE is transforming the way citizens interact with the New South Wales planning system. We're also undertaking work in partnership with the New Zealand uh, Ministry of Business with the launch of Business Connect, yep. you know, a platform to make it easier for small business to access services from multiple government agencies. And look, that's an incredibly powerful story. So look, just to finalise, you know, it has been a challenging time for the public sector during the current crisis. I'm confident, given the incredible efforts that we've seen from the public sector, that they will rise to the challenge, use this as an opportunity to crush complexity and deliver new possibilities for citizens. Well, Rob, thanks for your insights. Um, there's a lot of what you've talked about today in the presentations we're about to see. So I hope everyone enjoys uh, what we've put together today. And uh, on with the show. Thank you, uh, Luke and Rob. Um, uh, amongst many things, um, legacy systems always get my attention. Um, is government customers want the same experience uh, they're getting from industry. Um, think about all of the apps you've got um, at, that you use every day, whether it be uh, organising a, a ride to work or um, organising a meal or, or a reservation somewhere um, or some tickets. Uh, and, and the uh, public want the same experience when they're dealing with, uh, with government. Um, I'd like to uh, now introduce um, the Honourable Victor Dominello, Minister for Customer Service, New South Wales Government. Um, I'm sure we're all um, very um, au fait with, with uh, uh, Minister Dominello um, and some of the work they've been doing in New South Wales. Um, he's going to talk today about um, telling government once um, and re therefore reducing complexity in order to deliver um, citizen-centric services. I'd like to welcome uh, the Honour Honourable Victor Dominello. Hi, I'm Victor Dominello, Minister for Customer Service. Can I begin by acknowledging country and pay my respect to elders both past and present. And thank you for having me at this Evolve Government Seminar. What I want to do is challenge the way that we think that government operates. Traditionally, government operates by being at the centre of the universe, i.e. everything evolves around us we get the clients to come to us. We make sure that they fit in with our schedules, they fit in with our forms, our systems, our understanding. And that's sort of OK if there was one government. But as all of you know, uh, government has many moving parts. Uh, there's various different agencies with enormous uh, complexities and, and depth of understanding in their own silos. So government isn't one sun, it's several suns. There's the transport sun, there's the health sun, there's the education sun, et cetera, et cetera. And evolving around each and every one of those is a heavy burden for the average citizen. Because quite frankly, it's hard enough for government to understand itself, let alone the customer or the citizen understanding us. So if we were to flip that paradigm and truly be the service in the public service, i.e. we put the people at the centre of everything we do and we evolve around their needs. We fit into their understanding of the world. We customise service delivery for them based on their choices. We empower them. Then that is what good government should look like. I'm pleased to say that we're well and truly on that journey. And that's why we created the Department of Customer Service. 
Today I want to explore with you what we are doing, particularly in relation to the business side of things and how we can put businesses at the centre of the universe and how we can evolve or revolve around them to help them in their journey. So let's start with businesses. What we're creating here in New South Wales, particularly through the Department of Customer Service, is a, a service for business, which is basically like Service New South Wales for individuals, but we're now creating a business profile for them. And that means it's basically a tell us once approach. And if they come to us and whether we are providing grants for bushfire relief or drought, uh, or even in relation to the recent COVID experience or the Dine and Discover vouchers, they set up an account, uh, they tell us once, and with their authority, we save it in the system so they don't have to tell us again and again and again. And more importantly, they tell the Department of Customer Service, i.e. Service for Business once, and then with their consent, that gets federated out right across government. So they don't have to tell transport again, or health again, or education again, i.e. tell us once. That's the entry door, or the entry point, for good uh, government service delivery. Now, after they've told us once, because they understand that government is one big beast, how can we optimise uh, that journey for businesses? Well, the next touch point with businesses is through the regulators. Again, imagine if you're a small business. Uh, you have to deal with uh, potentially safe work on a Monday because there was a slipping incident. Uh, maybe on a Tuesday, if you're in a, a restaurant, uh, you might have a food authority because of there's a, you know, an outbreak. Uh, on the Wednesday, you might have fair trading in because of a complaint in relation to pricing. On the Thursday, uh, you might have even the EPA coming in because your kitchen's making a lot of noise because of a faulty fan. You get the drift. You, every arm of government is going to be knocking on the business door at different times, asking for different information, and again, slowing the business down. If we created an e-regulator platform, it means we can provide a really good service for businesses, and we keep the deep expertise of the uh, various agencies, whether it's EPA, Safe Work, Food Authority, etc., etc., And that's what we're building out now, an e-regulator platform. And it, again, it means that Safe Work can continue to do the great work they do. Fair trading, the great work they do. The same with the branding, because the brand is there, it's recognised, it's trusted. Same with the EPA, same with the Food Authority, and same with all the other agencies inside of government that have a regulatory interface. But for them to be effective, uh, it need, they need to publish on the e-regulator platform. And that e-regulator platform sits behind Service for Business, so it's that one-stop shop, that one interface with business. So rather than dealing with 100, they're dealing with one. Now, then take that further. Imagine what we're now doing for e-planning, e-construction, uh, e-property, essentially what it's going to be, because it then will incorporate the Strata Hub and it will incorporate digital twins. Once all of this comes into place, you can see how we are now making things much easier for business. For example, in relation to if you're an accountant, in the future, it's not just about uh, doing the tax returns, it's about adding value to the business. So in the future, you could be an accountant saying to uh, somebody that wants to buy a coffee shop, look, I would not buy a coffee shop here unless you are the best barista in the world because there's already five that exist. They've been there between 10 and 20 years, so they've got longevity. Uh, and there's another four coming in the pipeline, but there is not many DAs in the pipeline, i.e. it's a crowded market. So unless you've got a brand and it's very strong, don't go there. However, there's a pipeline of development over here. There's no coffee shop within Kuwi. Go there. And accountants then can build algorithms around you know, success. So I have now got an algorithm that, based on this very data inputs, can predict uh, success to a 72% uh, degree of confidence 
and that's the added value proposition. But in order to get that, they need access to e-planning. They need access to the e-regulator and all the regulation pieces there because we can see where the complaints are in relation to various businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is where the world is going, where we revolve and evolve around the people that we are elected to serve. Now, there is so much happening in this space. I could talk literally for hours, but I might stop there because what we need to do is make sure that on this journey, on this huge digital transformation journey that New South Wales is absolutely way ahead on, that we continue to put the people, the businesses, i.e. the people that we elected to serve at the centre of everything we do. Now, I constantly uh, publish a lot of material about uh, my thinking and the government's way forward in relation to the digital transformation and the journey that we're on. Uh, and you can look at that on my LinkedIn account. It's pretty active. I try to publish at least three to four times a week. So anyway, hopefully I get to see you and give me your feedback on uh, LinkedIn if you've got any ideas. I'm always interested in new ideas. Uh, my agency, I love Department of Customer Service, but they get nervous every time I post something on LinkedIn because I get a lot of feedback saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you change that? And inevitably that uh, feedback uh, goes to uh, the great Emma Hogan and her amazing team. Anyway, I wish you every success. Thank you for being part of this journey and thank you for putting our people first. Thank you, uh, Minister Dominello, uh, for that um, that address. Um, I think the takeaway for me there was that, uh, uh, as many of us know, the working government is the public see us as government, a single entity, not as a whole conglomerate of disparate organisations, which we working in government understand that we are 18 or 20 or 30 different departments, all doing different roles with different specialties. Um, being able to tell your t government your details once um, will help uh, in that customer experience. I'd now like to uh, to move on to our keynote, um, talking about e-planning, um, a project that I've heard a little bit about over the last uh, the last few years. Uh, phase four is uh, what we're up to now, and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Kirsten Fishburne, uh, Coordinator General from the Planning Delivery Unit in uh, New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Uh, welcome, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Rowan, and hello to everyone out there in the digital world. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge country. I'm on Gadigal land today of the Eora Nation, and I know we're on many different places. It's always great when you're talking about planning to really reflect on our traditional custodians of the land. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here today to talk about the planning delivery unit and how e-planning is integral to our work and our success. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my unit does and then talk more about how we're using e-planning as a tool to enable and, and bring insights into our work and into the planning system more broadly. So the planning delivery unit is a, is a fairly new unit Sorry, I'm just being told we can't see you, but my webcam is on. Uh, I'll just pause for one second to check in. This is uh, the irony, isn't it, when you go to talk about technology and your technology appears to fail. Okay, I've been told continue. Okay, thank you. So the planning delivery unit is a, is a fairly new unit. We were stood up in the middle of last year as part of a broad uh, suite of planning reforms introduced by the New South Wales government. Uh, I always stress to people that we haven't been established to add another layer to what people feel is an already complex planning system. On the contrary, we're there to unblock blockages within the planning system and to help it move more effectively and efficiently. Uh, so we're essentially the, the plumber of New South Wales planning. 
I want to talk about the type of work we do and then our digital tools. So first to stress, we're not here to make a planning decision. We're here to help when something has been blocked or unduly delayed in planning or when it has become particularly complicated. We do that use it in, in three different areas predominantly. The first is case management of particularly complicated projects or things that have been time delayed in the system. So I have a range of case managers who take on a referral from a government agency, from a proponent, a developer, or from a council, and they work through where the issues are, where the problems might be, and try and resolve those to, to unblock the blockage, essentially. The second piece of work we do is around concurrence and referrals in the New South Wales planning system, and I'll flag that now and come back to it later. Our third area of work is around planning concierge, and I'm really glad that Minister Dominello spoke first because we've kind of nicked a lot of ideas out of Service New South Wales for the planning concierge. The planning concierge is a one-stop shop where people can come to us for advice about who to speak to in the planning system. And and major developers and investors can get some guidance and assistance in developing planning pathways. So we're essentially opening the door into, into planning for people and, and providing some transparency in what has frankly been a fairly opaque environment in the past. Uh, the, this planning concierge service is really enabled by using a whole range of digital tools, particularly employing really smart customer relation management so we understand who is speaking to whom, uh, what are the touch points, and we're able to act as a real database and, and an open address book, really, for anyone who needs to work and integrate in the planning system. So we provide that type of service uh, at, 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 in, in a face-to-face -face context, but we're looking over time to how we can digitise that as well. So instead of having to ring us to find out who you need to speak to in transport about X matter, we want to be able to help people do that in a much more automated and immediate way. Uh, so we were stood up during COVID and I always joke that if I get asked that question about, um, you know, difficult uh, things that you've had to do in your career, I think establishing a new unit in the midst of a pandemic probably wins the prize. But what I realised very rapidly was that being in this new world, this new digital environment and space is actually a real strategic advantage to the type of work we do because we're able to convene and bring people together in a digital digital environment much more effectively and efficiently than we would have been able to do in the past. Um, this has been a real advantage. I have to say there's some disadvantages too. A lot of our work is around relationship management and, and mediation, and it's quite hard to do that in a digital space. So I think what we're all learning coming in and out of COVID is that, uh, you know, we need to create a hybrid world, take advantage of the great things we've got, but not lose some of the benefits benefits of being around individual people. So that's one of the kind of digital spaces that we, we've really learned a great lesson from, and I'm sure we're not unique. Um, we are able to just give that much more immediate customer service um, as, as a consequence of the environment we've all been forced into. But I do want to talk to you about e-planning and how we use that and how that's made such an enormous difference to the type of work that we 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 do. So to, to set the scene a little bit, there, there has been a previous iteration of the planning delivery unit about six or seven years ago that frankly did, didn't end up with, with great success. And so there was some trepidation when my unit was first established as to whether we would actually be able to achieve anything in this environment. Uh, now, and I have been saying to everyone, I have one advantage that, that the previous unit didn't have, and it is such an enormous advantage that I, I think we, we are set up for success now rather than the previous environment. And that is the introduction over e of e-planning. You heard Rowan say we're up to e-planning iteration four, and it is a continuously evolving environment and we're, we're learning and improving on it all the time. But in a nutshell, e-planning um, brings all of the council and departmental interactions on plan in planning and all of the interactions that, uh, that uh, other agencies have in the planning space onto an e-planning platform where it is transparent um, and real time in relation to where planning matters are. So I mentioned my unit has to work and take responsibility for concurrent 
recurrence and referrals. And these are a bit of the planning system, but they're actually quite complicated. This is when another state agency has, or, or, or SOC, has to give a, a approval or advice on a particular planning matter. So you're getting planning matters going out to agencies for whom planning isn't their primary business. And it has always been a source of delay and frustration uh, to those in the planning system, to councils and, and to developers, that things will sit in agencies, sit in agencies, and you know, you're not going to get them back. And I'm not criticising the agencies here. It is not their first order business to deal with these matters. By transitioning all concurrence and referrals onto the e-planning system over the last year, we have been able now to, to, to have one source of truth. So when I was a council general manager, I used to endlessly complain that things were delayed in agencies. I mean, you, that's your that's your KPI when you're a council general manager. But I, it was always kind of apocryphal or, you know, you'd be digging for emails to see when you sent things. Now, courtesy of the of e-planning, we're able to look at a real-time dashboard. So, a council can look up where what matters they might have sitting with a particular agency and how long they've been there, where they are in the system and where they are in the line. So we've got a, a finally a source of truth that nobody can hide behind and the dashboard that allows agencies to see if they're falling down in their statutory timeframes, councils to see where material is and, uh, and developers as they're inputting their e-planning to have some level of confidence that things will be moving through the system more efficiently. They won't get lost you can't lose something, and that there is much greater oversight uh, of what's going on. We're not just using e-planning really as that's a, that's a bit of a stick in some ways. It's also a really great carrot because, for instance, we're able to build in this system, working very closely with the e-planning team, insights that my teams get from other agencies to help them do their work. So, for instance, we've been working very closely with Transport for New South Wales to get in spatial mapping into the e-planning um, system. So, they're not going to get sent a referral for something that's actually unnecessary now because the, the, the boundaries of what they want to see have been really clearly articulated. Likewise, working with things like utility agencies to make sure that they're only getting referrals that they need to get. They're not getting a blanket referral out the system, which is a little bit of a tendency of councils to deliver. So we're able to really make sure that we're narrowing down planning interactions to those that are absolutely beneficial to good planning decisions and necessary for agencies engagement and we simply wouldn't have been able to do that without the introduction of e-planning. As planning proposals and other planning matters are also integrated into the e-planning system, which is occurring over the course of this year, we have this enormous rich data mine about exactly what's happening in real time, giving us real time information. We're able to see where something is in the planning system, how long it's been there. There's a ability for the general public to get insight into planning matters done on, on a spatial basis. Councils are able to see where something is is moving through and over time we're able to build automation into the system so all of the unnecessary transactions that have been done by a human can be done via AI. So automatic uh, notifications back that your things have been lodged, a whole range of things that are just going to strip time out of the planning system. And time, of course, in the development community is money. As we know at the moment, we want to build ourselves out of a recession. So every day we can give back to get shovels in the ground is something something that has a broader net economic benefit. I'm coming close to the end of the time, I think. So I just want to talk about the few next steps that we're interested in both as a unit and using e-planning. Firstly, of course, we really want to mine this data so we understand at a granular level what is occurring in the planning system and start to look at how we can put in business improvements as a consequence. So a lo lot of data analytics to try and see where we're able to, to, to get get some great insights, um, you know, find out if something spends longer in pre-planning, does that mean a DA moves through faster? And feed that advice back through the industry so that the developers are, are giving better quality information right up front and through councils and through planning itself. We also want to work on some of the challenges we've identified. E-planning is being rolled out in the regions, yet for many councils, they struggle with digital connectivity themselves, let alone residents, mum and dad, residents who might want to put in one DA, never done it before.
before. So building some uh, capacity and capability into the regional areas, Rowan alluded to this right at the start, some of the challenges in the regions. We want e-planning to be a rich tool across all of New South Wales. It's not just for metropolitan Sydney. And then looking at how we integrate some of the insights we're getting from e-planning with the insights we're getting through our planning concierge about what industry is looking for and, and, and feeding for from us. So I think I'll leave it there and just ask if there's any questions. I'm nearly out of time, so I'll, I'll throw back to Rowan. Thanks very much, uh, Kirsten. Um, yeah, we don't seem to have any, any questions from the audience, um, but I, I certainly do have one. You, you spoke uh, <laughs> uh, industry a lot um uh and uh and 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 you know developers and and construction um uh, industry uh can be a little bit complicated to work through um i'd be interested in knowing um what is the uh, industry um response been like to to your department's um work so far uh, enormously well received, Rowan. Um, I think e-planning itself has been really well received by by the development community, construction community, and and councils. Um, always teething problems as as you introduce a new thing, but broadly that idea of having real time data for developers being able to track where their thing is in the system has been really appreciated. Then bringing the planning delivery unit in on top of that has given them that added layer of. of of, of confidence that people are paying attention to uh, their planning matters, to making sure that things are moving through quickly. And, and as I said, really using the data analytics to try and, you know, create a virtuous circle. We're not just going in there fixing a problem. We're going in there fixing a problem and then using that insight and using the data we've gathered to make things easier for industry, for council, for other agencies, for everyone who interacts. That customer service mindset as well has been really appreciated and we're really fortunate in the way we've been established that we're not determining planning matters so we can be like the Switzerland of planning. We can talk to anyone involved in the planning system without it potentially compromising a determination decision. So I think that's been really widely appreciated as well. So I've got a I've got a like kind of perfect storm of really good things that is happening but I cannot stress enough how our business ability to do our job has been enhanced, in fact, I would say almost completely enabled by the, the great benefits and rich data that we're getting out of the e-planning system. Well, fantastic, uh, Kirsten. That's that's really good to know. Um, and uh, I'll have to re remember that term being uh, about being the Switzerland of, of planning. I think that's a great uh, great <laughs> term. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for persevering through the, uh, the technology challenges that the uh, uh, online does present us. Um, thank you. Um, it, it, I'd like to move now. Move thank on you, to, Rowan. Um, it was great to speak with you. Thanks, Kirsten. I'd like to now move on to the international presentation. Um, headlined as Agency Modernisation to Improve Customer Service. Um, welcoming uh, Justin Lewis, the bold Labresh, um, the uh, co-director Enterprise uh, Digitisation and Case Management from the Internal Revenue Service in the United States. Elizabeth McNamara. Um, the uh, Digital Transformation Program Director for the FDA, Centre for Devices and Radiological Health. And uh, last but not least, uh, Doug Averill, the Vice President, Global Industry Market Leader, Government uh, from Pegasystems. Welcome to our joint IRS and FDA panel discussion, where we'll be speaking with agency executives about their modernization vision and goals of improving customer experience. So joining us in the session today are Liz McNamara from the FDA and Justin abola Brush from the IRS. Liz is the Digital Transformation Program Director at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And Justin is a co-director in the Enterprise Digitalization and Case Management Office. Justin, Liz, thank you both for joining us here today. Hi, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. So interestingly, uh, your agencies, as we've been speaking here on and off for a few days here, it's clear that you're both on very similar modernization journeys. So I'd like to ask you first, Justin, tell us how your team is dealing to implement some of the changes that are required related to the Taxpayer First Act. Well, that's a great question because the IRS is really focused on hitting it out of the ballpark when it comes to the Taxpayer First Act. And at the heart of that is the taxpayer experience. 
And so my office, the Enterprise Digitalization and Case Management Office, was established earlier this year to spearhead our IRS efforts to improve that taxpayer experience, to let taxpayers and employees work together to resolve issues in a simplified digital environment. I think that's the heart of the Taxpayer First Act. Together with my co-director, Harrison Smith, we're really focused on consolidating aging systems and migrating those business processes over to a common platform using Pegasus systems. Some of the improvements that we're working on include electronic case files, increasing digital channels and self-service options available to our taxpayers, and streamlining our employees' access to data so they can resolve issues more quickly. I think this is gonna transform the way the IRS engages and works with the public. Taxpayers will receive faster service, and the IRS employees are going to have the ability to comprehensively resolve issues that taxpayers bring to them. This is a great framework. It's really focused on helping the IRS modernize quickly and deliver the value to the taxpayer that's at the heart of the Taxpayer First Act. Yeah, that's great. And you know, you're painting this vision of improved outcomes through better service, better, faster service and self-service. So there's a lot going on there. Liz, over to you. Can you tell us, uh, just to frame this up, what the Center for Devices and Radiological Health's total product lifecycle program is gonna mean to driving some better outcomes? Sure, thanks, Doug. The Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH, implemented a new approach on how it conducts business and the way it is structured back in 2019. Total Product Lifecycle, or TPLC, transformation is an opportunity to increase information sharing across the center, enhance collective decision-making, improve work-life balance, and increase professional opportunities for employees. So basically, TPLC is a holistic approach that takes into account all the steps and processes that lead to the design, production, use, and impact of safe and effective high-quality medical devices for our country. Digital transformation was also started in 2018, and that was in a center-wide five-year initiated program to provide technical solutions and platforms to support all of these reimagined and improved processes. So basically, we are building the plane while we're still up in the air. We have to continue to support the mission of FDA and CDRH while we transform our business process and technology. Yeah, got it. So your, your modernization program is clearly really complex. There's no lack of complexity, which I think you know a lot of IT leaders in government can relate to. So when you think about sort of innovative thinking and, and rethinking experiences, you know, I'll hear from both of you, but first, maybe back to you, Liz. You know, how, who are your customers and, and what are you doing to innovatively rethink their experience? So as shown in the diagram, our customers are twofold. We have external stakeholders depicted in the top layer. That includes patients and providers in the healthcare ecosystem, the medical device manufacturers, and our clinical partners participating in trials and research. Our second cohort are at the bottom of this diagram, and they are made up of CDRH staff and medical experts who manage the TPLC of these medical devices. They are currently using a hodgepodge of homegrown applications that don't promote information sharing or decision support. So we're bringing Pegasus Systems in to provide that one-stop platform, which is your two portals on the left, for most of our to meet most of our business capability needs. Got it. I love this diagram because it really paints a picture of, of the level of complexity, as I mentioned before, that you're up against. And you've got a lot going on here. So we know that a lot of these journeys are, are never straightforward and there's sort of forks back and forth and it can't be easy. So maybe, I guess, could you paint a picture of some of the challenges you're facing and, and how you're addressing them? Yes. So CDRH is a mission-oriented center, and it's filled with the country's greatest minds in biomedical engineering, regulatory law, medical science, and innovation. We are also, at this time, heavily involved in COVID-19 activities. So finding time for business and technical groups to make the mental leap from a rapid response of their day-to-day -day work to envision future state processes and technology is somewhat difficult. And like many places, uh, changes are not always welcomed by staff. Another challenge is that there's no one system that's going to provide all of our capabilities. So it requires integrating a bunch of different applications of which PEGA will be the key platform. Lastly, there's really no roadmap for us to go by on this, as CDRH is a one-of-a-kind environment with unique business processes and needs. 
In fact, we oversee over 6,500 medical, different medical device product categories, and these are from 21,000 different device manufacturers. So these different types of devices require different regulations and different processes. So sometimes that makes standardization very challenging as well. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, 21,000 device manufacturers, 6,500 different devices. You've got people who are really focused on rapid response and you're pulling them to think longer term strategically. There's so much going on in your world. You know, how do you, how do you manage this? How do you move quickly to meet all of these challenges in light of all the change? So there, we try to employ a couple of solutions, but two that are really taking hold are one, we're developing low fidelity prototypes so that we can help our stakeholders uh, see how their user experience can change and embrace a new way of doing their work. The second thing we've done is we've established a TPLC task force. And this group is a small group and meets ahead of all the development work we're doing in PEGA. And they are tasked to assess, harmonize, and prioritize all the different processes that TPLC includes and predict what type of business resources we're gonna need and when we can schedule um, their time, so we um, how much time we need, so we can schedule that at least two weeks out. Mm -hmm. The task force also makes sure we have established goals, desired outputs, and clear agendas when we do meet with the business. And we also are going to provide a Sprint Zero toolkit that will really be a reusable tool to help uh, each of the teams start their development work. I love it. It's great to hear how you're really pulling all of the best practices together, iterative development, prototyping, governance, reuse, and sort of this overarching communication that's happening around all of it. I mean, it's a great way to, to, to manage the change that we were just talking about. So Justin, a minute ago, you'd mentioned the Taxpayer First Act. Maybe you could tell us about some of the work that uh, your teams and others at the IRS are doing that are helping you meet some of the internal and external expectations around this act. Absolutely. Before I dive in on enterprise case management, I want to broaden our focus just for a little bit and talk to you about two IRS initiatives that are providing value already to the taxpayer. So one of those is the success we had earlier this year, making it possible for taxpayers to file an amended 1040. So before taxpayers, if they wanted to amend their 1040, had to file it in paper, and now you can file it electronically. We also have been adding new features to our online account and so if you haven't gone to irs.gov and logged into your secure online account as an individual taxpayer, I really encourage you to do that. We have a lot of great functionality there to be able to see your taxpayer account, any bills you may have to. Now I wanna dive in a little bit deeper on enterprise case management, which is where we're using Pega systems. So the graphic in front of you talks to the strategic way we think about enterprise case management and what we're trying to accomplish. On the left-hand side is the core IT piece, standing up the platform, putting it in the cloud, connecting it to our on-premise data systems, it's core technology. Next to that, you've got business process modernization and migration. And like Liz is undertaking at the FDA, we're really trying to make certain that we modernize our business processes to take full advantage of the technology. And one thing I liked that she was talking about was the Sprint Zero package to communicate to people what the expectations are up front. I love that. And the low fidelity prototypes to help people get a better sense of what PEGA can do for them. So I'm gonna to try to take those practices back to my own office. In the middle, we've got integration with common services. We're really trying to make it possible for employees to access all the different systems they need through PEGA. So they don't have to log into a variety of places to research things to address a customer's need. That should make it faster and easier to respond to the taxpayer. Next to that, moving to the right, we are trying to make really wise investments in our legacy environment. We have like 60 legacy case management systems. And as we migrate people off of them, we need to keep those running, but we don't want to overinvest. And then on the far right-hand side, we've got decommissioning. And that's the end of the road. We really want to take these legacy case management systems and turn them off as quickly as we can. So across these five pillars, you can see the challenge in front of us in the IRS, which is stand up PEGA, modernize and migrate over 250 business processes on, representing 45,000 users, give them what they need right in PEGA so that they can do their job quickly and get the taxpayers' needs addressed, make minimal investments in our legacy environment, and move as rapidly as we can to decommissioning. Got it. And I got to say, I, I 
as a side note, I love the uh, real-time cross-agency collaboration we're witnessing today. That's great. But, uh, you know, from your point of view, Justin, you've got 250 business processes, 45,000 users is what you'd said across all of these different applications. You've taken on a lot really quickly in your team with the goal of reducing complexity and, and ultimately improving that experience. So when you think about some of the outcomes you're trying to achieve, you know, what are the operational and, and process types of improvements that are on your roadmap that are really going to help you get there in an impactful way? That's a great question. Well, first and foremost for us is value to customer. And so we had to find a starting point that would immediately let us demonstrate that enterprise case management using Pegasus systems was going to deliver a better customer experience. So we selected a small process called tax exempt government entities, exempt organizations, customer support that handles questions from the public about exempt organizations. And we selected it because it was taxpayer facing. So it has that value equation built in relatively straightforward, small number of employees, about 30 co-located in one place in Kentucky. And everything we need for that particular business process, we can reuse to accelerate our activities going forward. So what does that process look like before we start? Well, before we started modernizing, that process is entirely manual. So the paper letters come in from the public through the mail, the mail gets opened, a clerk puts that mail into a filing cabinet, a literal filing cabinet, which is our check-in check-out system to control the inventory. Research is done in a variety of systems. The employee then consolidates the response and sends it back to the taxpayer. Since April, when we acquired Pegasystems licenses, we've been able to create a much more digital experience. The taxpayer will be able to come in through irs.gov starting in December to ask these questions. Residual paper will be scanned in. Case files will be paperless. Our filing cabinet will get repurposed and used for something else out there in Kentucky. Our employees will be able to do their research right from Pega and be able to holistically address that customer need and send a response back. And it's just the tip of the iceberg for us because everything we've done is going to be reused for the next set of business processes. And so I imagine that over the next year, we'll have several more business processes, customer facing and internal, delivering value in Pega systems. And that's, the, that's our secret sauce, small reusable components scaling quickly to provide value. It's so great. In, in both FDA and IRS stories, I don't think people necessarily appreciate just how challenging this type of large scale modernization can be. So really um, applaud you and, and your teams. We know that this is absolutely a, a team sport as you're going across uh, this or down this journey. So I do want to thank both of you and your teams for, for uh, the work that you're doing and making the, uh, the customer experience in government better. And thanks to both uh, you, Justin, and Liz for joining us today and sharing your experience. Thank you, Dad. Thanks. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. And thank you uh, to Justin. Uh, and Elizabeth from the IRS and the FDA in the US, and uh, Doug uh, Averill from uh, from Pega. Um, interesting uh, approaches from uh, two very different organisations. Um, uh, I think you uh, would have to agree. Now, coming a little bit closer to home, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Adrian Jacobs, uh, Senior Director for Business Engagement and Systems uh, Innovation and Technology Group from IP Australia, um, talking about how they've been building a world-class um, intellectual property rights platform um, to help deliver outstanding organisational and customer success. Um, welcome to Adrian. Uh, I'm Rob Bollard and I'm the Industry Principal for PEGA in the public sector for APAC. And look, I'm really excited today to be joined by Adrian Jacobs, uh, one of the key leaders in transforming IP Australia to deliver world-class service and really be a leader in innovation and technology within the government. So thank you for joining us today, Adrian. Thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. Look, earlier on today we were having a chat and you know we were talking about intangible assets and, and how over our lifetime they're now valued at about 86% of the value of top S&P 500 companies and that they're really the new fuel for economic growth. 
And that really puts IP front and centre in any economic discussion and really important for the government. So can you tell us a little bit about IP Australia for those in the audience who you know, might not have engaged with your agency before? Yeah, sure. So IP Australia is a fairly small agency. It's Australian federal government agency that's re responsible for the administration of intellectual property rights and legislation relating to patents, trademark, designs and plant breeders' rights. Uh, the agency has around 1,200 people uh, and contributes to the innovation system more broadly by using its skills and experience uh, of its team to advise government on Australian, and Australian businesses on how to make the most of their IP rights. IP Australia is committed to delivering world-leading services that are modern, effective and efficient to all Australians benefit from great ideas. Look, thanks Adrian. I know that IP Australia has been really one of the success stories within the federal government around delivering real transformation and real benefits for the customers and also the organisation itself. Can you tell us a little bit more about IP Australia's digital journey? Yeah, sure Rob. IP Australia is one of the first fully digital federal government agency increasing its digital transaction services. The agency has just undertaken one of its largest transformation projects in its 100-year history to realise its vision to provide a world-leading IP system. As part of the transformation, the agency has launched its rights in one program. Pegasystem replaced over 60 legacy systems, allowing all IP rights to be managed on a single platform. We have seen significant benefits for both our organisation and for our customers through increased efficiency, improved quality and service delivery, as well as simplifying our technology stack. What I'm most proud about is that we've managed to roll out world-class tools for our staff and our customers. PEGA has played a major part in this uh, as it allows us to be agile and gives us the ability to make changes quickly and cost efficiently. As you know, the public sector agility has become crucial, whether it's in, to deal with once-in-a-lifetime situations like COVID um, or managing the ongoing rising of customer expectations. Mm, terrific. Look, so Adrian, one of the key components you highlighted was really around agility. And, you know, we know in this sort of fast-paced environment that being able to change and adapt is so important for organisations, and, and especially uh, organisations from a technology perspective. Mm. So we know that there's increasing pressure from business and customers for faster delivery to build trust and also build value. Um, how has PECA provided the agility in this journey? Yeah. As you know, Rob, agility has become front and centre and a key priority for us, not just in our systems, but how we manage and build for the future. We've always emphasised that Rio is a business transformation program, not just in technical, one, but we've invested heavily in working with our key business users to re-engineering and business process, re-engineering, sorry, re-engineering our business processes to the greatest extent possible to support repeatability and reuse up front. We view the program uh, as a partnership between IT and business. Uh, and which is completely built on trust. We selected PEGA as our platform as it's supported repeatability of functionality, presented out-of-the-box features for government and provided low-code options to accelerate solutions. Having as a service architecture allowed us to fix things once and apply universally. We have adopted a fully agile approach to build and fix and invest in DevOps capability, test automation, digitised release management to drive results uh, faster. We've invested in developing in-house capability to configure our solutions um, to understand issues. For example, our PEGA delivery manager was someone from business uh, who is now managing the process of enhancements and fixes, which I think is very powerful stuff. Central to IP Australia's transformation was the creation of an agile development environment. Prior, prior, prior to implementing a range of technical solutions, including PEGA, the agency could take months to roll out new functionality to, for users and customers or respond to legislation changes. Now as part of the broader program of work around continuous delivery changes can be made uh, and results uh, resolved uh, in almost real time, which I think is pretty amazing stuff. It's within the new agile environment that IP Australia has been able to respond to, has been able to expand its continu continuous delivery pipeline capabilities to include seamless deployments and faster and more frequent releases. We've managed to increase our production releases by up to 70% and decrease our external outages by up to 80%. This means that customers uh, can still interact with our system while we're making changes uh, to, to the back-end systems or the front-end systems. And this is something that IP Australia has never, ever done before or had the ability to do. This is an important leap forward, for which means that we can do more system changes without major impacts on the system's availability and impacting our customers. Look, that's a terrific story and really amazing the work that IP Australia has done. Look, a number of uh, significant major digital transformation projects tend to fail or at least get into a lot of trouble. 
What do you think are the ingredients to deliver success on what are often complex and challenging journeys uh, for organisations? Digital transformation demands executive vision and leadership. It requires a laser focus on outcomes and benefits management as the primary drivers for success. As I mentioned previously, it is critical to think of these pieces of work through both a business, customer and technology lens. These are often once in a lifetime opportunities to rethink how work is done and redesign the business and customer experience to position for the future. Be agile and prepared to pivot. The landscape in which business operates is continuously evolving, so organisations today should be prepared to shift their strategies along with it. An agile approach focuses on value can help make incremental iterative progress towards your goals, while also allowing you to manage in complexity and unpredictability along with your journey. In order to succeed, you need to select technology that supports your long-term vision build strong technology partnerships and invest in uplifting the internal organisation capability to ensure the long-term support and success. Crucial to success is bringing customers and staff along the journey. Build trust, cooperative co-development and agile approaches that communicate the changes in a timely fashion and builds buy-in is essential to success. Look, that's some terrific insights, Adrian, so thank you very much. So look, from an IP Australia perspective, like. You know, where to next and what is your major focus for this year? Thanks, Rob. I think there's one thing that we'll be focusing on moving forward. It will be building our automation and AI capacity. We want to continue to automate our end-to-end -end processing to deliver faster, higher quality and more cost-efficient services for our customers and deliver high-value jobs for our staff. We also want to augment our decisioning with AI to improve quality of our service to help customers make better decisions. AI is much broader than just technology. It requires us to think holistically across ethics, governance, legislation, change management and technology to get it right. We've done a lot of work to update our legislation, engage with our stakeholders and staff, build technology capability as well as carefully developing our frameworks that build confidence to ensure automation is considered in appropriate circumstances. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. And on behalf of PEGA, I just want to thank you and IP Australia mm -hmm. for taking the time to provide some of those valuable insights. And we continue to wish you all the very best on your journey moving forward. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thank you. And thanks to uh, Adrian and Rob there um, for a fascinating insight into what IP Australia um, has, been, uh, has been doing uh, in their environment. I'd like to now move into the um, executive panel um, discussion for this event, um, designing services that respond to um, life journeys and, and delivering uh, citizen-centred uh, value. Um, first uh, panellist I'd like to introduce is Lewis Clark. Uh, Lewis is the Executive Director of Customer Payment Services and Transport for New South Wales. Welcome, Lewis. Thanks, Rowan. And uh, next we uh, Paul Duffler. Um, I'll get everybody to give a, a brief intro in a minute, but I'll get uh, you on screen. Paul Duffler, uh, CTO from uh, the uh, Victorian uh, Government's Insurer and Risk Advisor, the VMIA. Hi, thanks for welcome. And uh, Monique Hitter, a Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Legal Aid New South Wales. Uh, good afternoon and welcome, Monique. Hi, Rowan. Hi, um, and Lewis, if you just want to give us a uh, 30 seconds rundown on, on who you are and where you, where you work and what you do. Yeah, so um, I'm Lewis Clark. I'm the Executive Director for Customers, Systems and Operations at Transport. Uh, broadly, that means I look after Opal tolling, some of our customer contact centres. We also do administration of concession schemes. Uh, across New South Wales and look after some of the back office systems that keep our road and public transport network looking. Fantastic. Thanks, Lewis. And uh, and Paul, um, as CTO down with the, uh, the Victorian Government's insurer, um, where do you fit into the, the, the scheme of things? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, working with the VMIA, we are the Government's insurer and risk advisor. Uh, I am the Chief Technology Officer 
and uh, I've worked in government for a while across tax, emergency services and now in insurance. Um, we're, we're in the process of building a new digital platform to replace our, our legacy systems and it's part of a broader client-centric business strategy. Uh, we work with, with other government clients um, but we also work with uh, community service, service organisations such as schools, cemetery trusts um, and, and, and not-for-profits. So uh, quite a wide footprint of uh, organisations and people across the community. Yeah, well, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Monique. Thanks, Rowan. Um, yes, my name is Monique Hitter. I'm the Deputy CEO of Legal Aid New South Wales. We provide legal services um, to the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people across New South Wales. We have around 700 lawyers and 1,300 staff in total that operate across New South Wales in regional offices and other locations. Fantastic, thanks, um, thanks, Monique. Um, the uh, and also I should um, just uh, mention for the audience that uh, Monique's on a bit of a tight uh, time frame, so if she does suddenly disappear um, from the panel in about half an hour, that's uh, uh, she's had to race off to something else. Um, I guess today we're talking about aligning service design and delivery um, to provide real outcomes uh, for citizens. Um, it's around developing services and, and, and exploring fit for purpose systems. Um, Lewis, uh, I'd like to uh, go to you first and just um, quickly ask you um, about feedback um, when we're designing and shaping our, our systems. Um, uh, uh, how, have you got any examples of where you've been, uh, where services have been particularly well received by um, citizens? And how did your, uh, your team use that feedback um, to inform any redesign of those systems to make sure they were fit for purpose rather than the, the historical build up and they will come? Yeah, so Transport generally has a uh, really good voice of customer and customer uh, improvement program uh, mentality. What I found uh, most rewarding recently, I guess, is being able to work directly with customers and advocacy groups and peak bodies that are actually using our systems. That gets us some really honest and frank feedback, so we sort of uh, design these systems in Sydney. Some of our customers uh, uh, are out really far west in, uh, in New South Wales. And while it's functionally correct, if you actually talk to the customers about how they use the system, how they think about using the system, uh, it's really quite enlightening. So we've, we've really enjoyed the process of working with, working with customers, peak bodies and advocacy groups. Uh, and it's really made a difference to how we design the systems and how we improve them. And ultimately, what we have found is better customer experience actually makes it easier for us to process stuff because it makes sense on both ends of the process. Yeah, that's that's an interesting um, point you talk about. Um, you know, Western New South Wales, particularly, um, Lewis, uh, you know, it's a long way from Sydney to Broken Hill. Um, I've driven that a couple of times um, and it's a long way uh, across there and, and how people use the, the systems are, are very different. Um, Paul, not quite with the same uh, uh, geography uh, challenges, um, but how have you, uh, how has your team used feedback um, uh, from the citizens and, and, you know, did you do any, any kind of redesign of your existing systems? Uh, yeah, we, we certainly did take into account and engage with a, a number of our clients uh, along the way. Um, obviously, with with insurance uh, in particular, it's it's one of those things people don't like to spend a lot of time engaging with. So, so the, the the most positive feedback and engagement we had was how to how to help our clients get in, uh, get their job done, and get back out really quickly. Um, and, and that was that was sort of something that, that resonated with them really, really uh, positively once we workshopped a few things. Um, the, the other end of the scale, though, of course, um, and it was interesting to hear a couple of the comments that have already happened uh, along the way in this session. Uh, with government, it doesn't always go well, you know, and, and we, we also, as well as collecting the upfront transactional experience, we have to deal with, in insurance, we have to deal with claims, and that's where, where obviously, it's, it's important then to have uh, not just that sort of raw transactional digital experience, uh, but, but 
provide some level of empathetic uh, interaction and, and, and add the human touch because uh, because it's very hard to run off a script when those sort of things happen. Uh, so so taking the time to listen to our clients and understand what their pain points, what what things would help them get moving again, uh, is really important. And the real challenge, I think, beyond what we're doing digitally at the moment, which is focusing largely on that sort of um, upfront transactional experience, is how to combine those two things together so that uh, so that when things do go wrong, and they, they inevitably do, we can still provide a really positive uh, client experience. Uh, and, and, and that part of our journey is, is probably where the most complexity lies, and we're spending the most time with our clients understanding how best to deliver services on top of that. Yeah, um, I guess that's um, uh, one of the the, the, um, the challenges um, for me, Monique, is is that as a as a technology person, um, I've got to keep reminding myself of the technology divide. And and I guess in many cases, your external customers are not having the best day um, that they've ever had when when they they kind of walk across your threshold. Um, uh, so how when you're talking about your systems um, and and how are you changing your um, uh, services and getting feedback from your um, your customers, uh, Monique? Yeah, I mean, we, we do that a lot, Rowan. Um, in terms of the engagement that we had with PEGA, we wanted to replace an ageing legacy system that had very limited support resources and a dependence on a small vendor and place it and replace it with a system that worked for our people internally, as well as our business processes, but but most importantly, as you say, our clients, which was quite complex because in a sense, the system had two sets of citizens. It had our internal staff um, who were using the system as well as our external clients. And so we needed to develop a system that could work well for both of those sets of, of clients. And so we, we, we worked with CoForge, who was the partnering PEGA at the time and um, we told them what we wanted to achieve and through that partnership and embedding um, both the voice of our internal clients but also importantly embedding the voice of our external clients which we got through surveys and feedback and other sources we were able to develop a system that met the needs of both our internal clients and our external clients. Yeah, and that's always a, a challenge, um, Monique. I might just stay with you and, and uh, uh, just move on a little bit. I, sometimes it, it is difficult to see, um, as it were, the, the customer um, in our back-end business systems, and I say our, in our government back-end business systems. Um, how did um, New South Wales Legal Aid, um, you know, keep the, the citizen, I guess, um, at the at the centre of what it is you do? Um, obviously, you, you, you're um, very much customer-facing organisation working in, in justice. Um, but uh, even when even when some of these systems just don't even come anywhere near um, one of the external customers, um, how do you keep them in in mind at, at, across the organisation? Yeah, I mean it's it's a challenge and it's it's a great it's a great point to raise. Um, the system that we were developing is was definitely a back end system. In terms of our front line service delivery, the clients are absolutely at the centre of everything that we do in the design of our legal services. And the challenge is to um, import that thinking and approach to the development of back-end systems. Because what we find is if the back-end system isn't completely in tune and aligned with the frontline service delivery, if there's a disconnect there, then our, not only do our staff tell us about it, but our clients tell us about it as well. So it was really important for us to take the feedback from our clients our external clients about how they wanted to interact with us and import that thinking into the development of the back-end system. Yeah, okay, fantastic. That's great. Um, and Lewis, um, given the, the, the scale of, of your environment that you're working in um, physically and from a technology perspective, um, what's been your, uh, your experience and how have you been able to keep uh, the citizens at the centre of everything that, uh, that you've been doing, particularly with the back-end business systems? Yeah, thanks, Rowan. Uh, for me, I think it's really about trying to connect the connect the people in my team with the customers that they're servicing. And again, for example, earlier, being able to get people out and about to meet the communities that they're supporting, to be able to uh, meet the advocacy groups and really understand the context in which they're doing work, uh, doing their work helps. That sort of gives us 
uh, a feed from both ends in terms of what customer needs uh, and what our team needs. And what's interesting, but, but possibly not surprising, is actually customers and customers of the team generally have difficulties uh, because of the same thing. There might be a bit of a disconnect there. But if you, if you take that end-to-end -end focus and invest a bit of time with the team, making sure uh, they're sort of connected to the context and the customers, very quickly you start to get a feedback loop that, that allows you to make sure the back-end systems are, are supporting both, both your own staff and, and importantly supporting customers, customers too. So I think with, with, without that end-to-end -end view, it gets it gets tricky uh, tricky quickly. But I've certainly found there's a whole load of benefit from making sure, as much as possible, you, you look at you, you look at it end-to-end. -end. I'm sure we, uh, you bring up an interesting point there. A little bit of a um, I guess I, I've often thought about the air gap between um, you know a, a back-end system and, and what people actually have to do in their in their day uh, day to day uh, business and. and there's lots of manual work and manual rework going on, um, and uh, even that automation will certainly make life um, easier for for everybody, um, particularly the people using those systems. Um, and Paul, um, what's your what's your experience down in in Victoria been like um, uh, with those um, you know, keeping the keeping the, the citizen at the at the the forefront of, of, of mind when you you're starting to uh, tinker around in the back end. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, a, a large portion of our of our legacy system um, modernisation and, and replacement is about the back end and, and the complexities of running our business. Um, fortunately for us, it's not just a standalone project. It is part of a, a broader business strategy, which is very client centric. So everything that we're doing is tied to those uh, those overall um, organisational goals, which very much have the, the client at the centre. Uh, so we have direct traceability and, and um, uh, sort of a culture of, of attaching to that idea in everything that we do. Um, and, and as we build out each journey along that, that pathway, um, there is a, a direct line of sight to, to what the end goal is, particularly with the customer in mind. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the key is uh, always to have the, the customer in mind. Um, I remember um, many years ago, uh, back in the the late 80s, um, walking into uh, the finance department. There was a sign on the on the wall that said "Revenue, Revenue, Revenue." Next question. Um, I guess we can translate that these days to "Customer, Customer, Customer." Next question. Um, the uh, whilst we're talking about the citizen um, experience and 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 the citizen centric value proposition. Um, which really everybody in government's talking about um, and many are doing. Um, I guess now I'm interested in what are some of the best ways to actually measure that, the success of those initiatives um, and, and how to measure the value or the impact of those services, um, not just from feedback, I guess, but how, how are we measuring that internally um, uh, to, to say, well, hey, look, we've, we've modified this system and, and now we've, or this process, now we, we're getting better outcomes. Uh, I might uh, dive across to you, Monique. Um, what's your uh, way of doing that in, in Legal Aid New South Wales? Thanks, Rowan. Um, I mean, we, we do it in a, in a variety of, of ways. As you say, we, we certainly appreciate the feedback and we survey our clients regularly to see how they are interacting with us. And, and whether there are any pain points in, in those interactions. Um, for us, the system um, produces really valuable data. And if we can use that data to, to do the things that we would like to do with that data, it gives us the 360 degree view of um, the work we do with our clients. It enables us to make strategic decisions about the allocation of resources. It enables us to ensure the quality of services that we provide, if the system is producing data which we can use for those really important purposes, then we can we can say that that the impact of that system is doing the job that we we want it to do, um, and and so the data that we're able to get from that system um, is a really important way of measuring the impact of the benefit of that system. And, and are you um, how how are you measuring the impact to the to your um, external customers, Monique? Um, uh, I, I guess um, are they did they view your organisation depending on the outcome that they get um, from the from the judicial system, or, or are you you're really keen on on how they 
not trying to get dipped down that rabbit hole, but trying to, to look at how they're, they're looking, they're, they've dealt with you, or you've dealt with them, I should say. Yeah, it's it's an interesting proposition to look at outcomes in legal um, matters because it depends on the kind of legal matter. So we operate a legal practice that spans across criminal, family and civil law. Um, and so measuring the outcomes of those uh, types of matters depends on the kind of jurisdiction that you're in. But what's important for us also, in addition to what outcomes we can achieve for our clients, is the way in which they interact with us. And if we are interacting with them in a way that they find um, functional, um, easy, um, and that they can tell us their story just the once, and we can provide a really quality service to that client that's appropriate and effective, then we're doing a really good job. And also, if we're reaching the clients that we should be reaching across New South Wales, we're, we know that we're doing a good job. So those are the kinds of ways we're measuring our impact. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and Lewis, uh, pop over to you to to, um, to see how you, uh, Transport New South Wales, are, are measuring um, the value and impact of these um, services and the changes to, um, uh, you know, uh, areas that we've improved. Yeah, similar answer, I, I think, to, to the other one. Uh, customer feedback is definitely an important part and gives us that sort of post-transaction view. We also spend, uh, invest a lot of time in customer satisfaction surveys, so, so, so to understand general satisfaction. There are things the systems can tell us in terms of uh, how cleanly and timely it is for a customer customer to get through transactions when they're when they're doing, uh, for example, applications for access to to concession scheme. I think we also look at the uh, efficiency for us to process as well. So as, as as I mentioned earlier, what we generally find is it is difficult for us to process or need to rework or needs more questions uh, back to the customer. That's generally because we're not doing a very good job with the application process to start with so 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 there's a variety of uh, variety of measures there some directly customer based uh, some we some we use the system to try and give us a bit of guidance but then have that feedback loop to be able to go and test that again again directly with customers yeah thanks thanks lewis um and certainly like to encourage um the audience to to submit questions um to the panel um, we'll ask uh, as many uh, questions of the panel as we as we have time for. So please uh, get typing and, and, and ask those questions. Um, and Paul, uh, down to you now. Um, how are you going through the the uh, uh, you know measuring um, the value and impact of, of services and changes that you're making to your um, uh, customers, given the the breadth of customers that you have across government. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not vastly different in some ways. Obviously, yes, we do we do quite a bit of uh, surveying by sort of uh, NPS style questionnaires. Um, we also do look to the data that comes out the other end, of course. So there's simple operational things like um, you know how long does it take to process a claim and all that sort of stuff. Um, but but the, the the more difficult things and the more challenging things tend to be a little less uh, quantitative and more qualitative. Uh, so, so we're really interested in having rich conversations with our, with our clients um, that connect to our strategy again uh, and our strategy at a, at a higher level is to make sure that our clients are covered by contemporary insurance solutions, they're, they're connected toward leading advice um, and they're confident in the risk-based risk decisions that they make. Um, so we, we try and have conversations particularly at the system owner level, at the department level and, and the portfolio agency level. Um, and the system owners across the, the community cohorts to make sure that uh, that cut through is coming through in their experiences and using our services. And as we change those services, um, they'll be meeting those strategic goals. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And that's a, a nice little segue into my next question, I guess. So I'll, I'll just stay with you for a minute. And, and that's about change, uh, management, managing change. Um, when you when you've had your, you've got your feedback and you've decided to make your, your changes to your to your environments and your systems. Um, and, and particularly as digital initiatives um, are starting to increase, um, uh, how have you managed the change effectively um, across your, your organisation and the, and the customers that you deal with? 
Uh, yeah, so um, pro probably less of a challenge, I suppose, from the uh, the, the client customer perspective. You know, um, going back maybe 20 years ago, we used to sweat quite a lot about how you would engage with your clients and and, and transform digitally and get them to transact online. Everybody's a consumer now, as was mentioned earlier. They, they sort of know how to do that. Um, we, we, we do have ways to provide that feedback through the change process. Um, the, probably the more difficult part is, is um, addressing the internal challenge of change, uh, particularly with a, a specialist level of, of technical knowledge within our staff cohort. Um, you know, they, they really know how um, the, the more complex parts of our business operate and um, are often a little bit uh, resistant and risk averse when it comes to messing with that system because they, they built that up over a number of years. So, so we've spent a fair bit of time um, challenging that thinking and, and encouraging them to look at an outcomes-based view of the world that might involve a slightly different process. Um, the first part to getting to that process has been in just getting a baseline set of capabilities up and running um, to give them the comfort that it'll still work um, and then encourage that sort of iterative development process whereby we can start uh, building building more interesting ways of doing things and tearing down some of the more complex things that are no longer seem necessary but still get the same outcome. And and yeah, and I guess that's that's always a that's always a, a complicated experience for everybody involved. And I guess one step at the t one step at a time is the the way I've seen it done um, quite successfully. Um, and uh, and Lewis, how have you uh, gone about um, managing change effectively um, as the, the the digital transformation of your organisation has gone on? Probably a, a similar answer to that that, that 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 Paul gave. I think having the ha, having the end to end view is is really important. I think having people in there that understand change management as a, as a methodology and, and investing is that I think that, that is important. I think the, the the culture within the team is also is also a really important contributor. People need to feel comfortable. To innovate, they need to be uh, feel comfortable to change, and we need to support them uh, su su support them to do that, and to feel comfortable comfortable to do that. The as I mentioned earlier, the the, the end to end views really helped with that, being able to connect people to customers because it helps them helps them think in a customer centric way, and certainly transport over the last ten years has has really moved forward in terms of aligning uh, largely the whole of transport to to what is the customer experience and and how, how do we improve that encouragement of innovation I, I think and labeling that within teams is also really important and innovation for me is much about enabling those those small incremental improvements as it is coming up with some big big fantastic Ideas. So I, I, I think in summary, it's really leveraging the methodology, methodologies that exist and knowing what's right, creating a culture for it to be successful and that sort of pinpoint focus on customer outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, um, Lewis. And, and Monique, um, what about in, in uh, Legal Aid there? How have you gone about managing the change effectively across your organisation? We focused on three key areas. The, the first being um, embedding our lawyers and support staff into the design of the system so that they then became champions and super users, if you like, of the system and assisting the rest of the business to adapt to, to the change that the system brought with it. Um, then using an agile approach where we could change the system to respond to what people have said aren't working or isn't isn't quite working for them. So being able to adapt and change certain aspects of the system in response to the needs of the business also really assisted in the acceptance of the new system. And finally, um, the system's functionality is key to the business accepting the change. Um, it's helping me do my job. Um, is really important to get across that if um, a staff member thinks, uh, 
I'm going to have a better time doing my job using the system. I'm going to, it's going to make my life a bit easier. Then they're going to, uh, they're going to embrace that new system much more fully. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Otherwise um, I've certainly seen that, that, that people will, um, inevitably come up with workarounds which, which kind of <laughs> ends up being back back to a manual uh, a manual process um, we do have a couple of questions coming in from the uh, from the audience now which is great um, I guess uh, one thing I'd like to do is just quickly run through the panel um, we've, we've got a couple of minutes to go um, and quickly talk about uh, 2020 um, which we can't kind of sit here in 2021 and ignore um, digital transformation agenda um, you know we all had them um, how did it change uh, pre-COVID versus um, post-COVID? In indeed, has it changed? Um, we might start at the top with you, uh, Lewis. Thanks, Ryan. So, so 2020 has, has definitely changed the way we the way we do things. The need to be able to move quickly and in an agile fan in an agile manner to react to some of the difficulties our customers were having has been really important. Being able to prioritise quickly has been really important and uh, really reinforce the benefits of small incremental improvements, which are able to help support our customers when they need it and in a more timely manner has been critical. I think the other thing we've, we've learned reflecting on it is you, you need to build your systems and processes to be prepared for lots of different scenarios. So I don't think, uh, I, I don't think any, any of us expected a global pandemic. There's been some things that, that in hindsight have been more difficult for us to change than, 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 than they should have been. And I think it really gives us that opportunity going forward whenever we're building functionality and thinking about customer interactions, thinking about if, if something changed quickly, can the, can the systems and processes keep up with what That's that's a great insight there, Lewis. Thank you. Um, I know in my own experience uh, with uh, human services um, uh, here in South Australia, um, you know, we decided in kind of March last year to to send the department home um, and have everybody work from home, other than obviously the frontline staff. And um, there were some challenges there that were kind of unforeseen. Um, we had a couple of people who didn't have computers at home, um, and a couple of people that had no um, internet connectivity at home uh, whatsoever. So um, there were some couple of curveballs thrown at us. Um, Paul, how did you uh, manage a um, uh, slightly different COVID experience, I guess, um, being in Victoria to, to much of the rest of the region, in fact? Um, how did you go about managing that? Uh, yeah, look, we, we, were, we were fairly fortunately placed in that we had a, a, our transformation um, kick off uh, before before that, it just became more important uh, from a from a working from home perspective. It was fairly seamless. We we had we were fortunate that we'd done a bit of uh, bit of preparation for mobility and, and work from where it makes sense beforehand. So uh, relatively quickly able to get our staff up and running from home uh, without too many troubles. But little did they think they would be there for that long because it was it was quite a long time. Um, but uh, but for our digital transformation, it really was just it became far more um, obvious that that's what we should be doing and spent far less time um, in sort of business case mode and, and a lot more conversations with our senior executive and with our board um, discussing about how we, how, how we were progressing, how quickly we were delivering and, and what the future facing things look like rather than um, justifying what we already planned to do. Yeah, certainly that change, I think, across um, across industry generally um, and across society generally. Um, and across to uh, Monique, um, we've got uh, about a minute, I think, before you've got to race off. So um, what uh, what's your uh, your uh, pre-COVID versus post-COVID digital transformation agenda look like? Um, yeah, look, thank, thanks for... Um, we were always moving towards a, a, a digitisation um, program at Legal Aid, even pre-COVID, we wanted to um, think about remote working policies and, and supporting our workforce to work more flexibly. Um, it's just that COVID made us have to do it so much more faster than we thought we would have to do it. Um, and we did it, um, you know, with the help of our IT systems and, um, and our staff being so cooperative, we were able to move them really quickly from an in-office environment to a working from home environment. And 
we've just um, leveraged off that and now are moving post-COVID to a situation where we, we're taking the learnings from the last year and applying them to, to this year and beyond in allowing our workforce to work flexibly, which is no mean feat when you're providing services in court and various other locations, but we've been able to, to manage it um, and to continue our journey to becoming more digitised as, as an organisation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Monique. Yeah, I, I certainly don't underestimate the challenges that, that uh, all of you have um, uh, experienced uh, in the last 12 months or so. Um, it's certainly been unique for all of us. Um, and uh, finally, a question from the audience, um, uh, which we'll see. Um, I've got some, I can answer it pretty quickly, really. Um, and it's about how do you build trust between IT and the business um, customers in, in transformation programs? And I guess. Uh, for me, what worked was um, opening up the lines of communication um, and specifically uh, using business partners and, and myself at the executive level um, going out to uh, the business and spending time with the business uh, as I did in the Northern Territory. Um, and uh, although I must admit down in South Australia, there are a lot less dirt roads um, and, and just actually learning what customers are doing and how they're using the systems and, and, and what some of their agenda and, and strategy is like. Um, and that's kind of the key is about building those relationships and building the communications and then the trust comes with um, with that and then you you know you're delivering not only delivering systems but you're delivering the right systems in the right time. Um, Lewis, do you have anything that you would add on that question? No, I think you've covered it nicely really creating that environment for collaboration, um, for transparency and uh, making sure that people are focused on the same. On the same thing and, and appreciate the importance of working together and getting that outcome i think goes a long way to uh, bring the teams together and build that trust very quickly yeah, it's, it's certainly very true very important um and uh paul uh yeah all of the above plus i think deliver 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 and deliver incrementally um you know one, if they think they're only going to get one shot at this they're they're going to be disappointed uh, but if you can prove uh, that you can deliver you can take feedback you can deliver again and you can reach, reach and repeat that then uh, that's a really trust building exercise absolutely um and monique finally yeah all of the above as well um including um being responsive being uh, really closely connected to the business so you can hear what's going on and, and, and being responsive to those, uh, to those voices, but also uh, to not overpromise, I think is important, um, to be realistic about what you can achieve and communicate that really clearly, just to manage people's expectations because sometimes they can uh, be bigger than what is realistically able to be provided by, by an IT department, for example. Absolutely, and that and that's that transparency uh, with all of your customers and stakeholders. I guess is is uh, if you can't do something, let them know and let them know why, and, and maybe able to work through uh, another solution to a given problem. Anyway, look, thank you uh, very much to the panel, um, Lewis, Paul, and Monique. Uh, we have gone a couple of minutes over time, but um, I certainly certainly thought that last question was uh, was worth asking. So thank you very much to um, to the panelists this afternoon. Um, in wrapping up, um, I'd certainly like to thank everybody uh, that's attended this afternoon um, at this uh, Evolve event, um, thanks to uh, PEGA and PEGA Systems, um, uh, without whom uh, this would not have been possible. Um, I'd also like to, uh, to thank uh, Petro and the, the team at uh, uh, Public Sector Network, um, who have been working for about six months, really, to put this, uh, this afternoon's um, event together. Um, I could talk for another half hour on all of the takeaways that I've got. I've got pages of stuff that I've been writing down. But I think um, there was one, I noticed some comments that uh, around connectivity in, in regional areas. I think they're really, really important. Um, you know, don't, don't assume because we're, we're in a city with 4G or 5G that, that uh, most of our constituents have that access. Um, that's a, a really um, dangerous assumption to make uh, if you want people to use your, your systems. Um, particularly in, in um, uh, you know, regional and, and remote Australia, the connectivity is just not there. 
Um, another takeaway really is government customers uh, want the same experience. Now, you've got to remember we're, we're government customers too, right? We have driver's licences and we do various other things. Um, so we're all looking for the same experience that we're getting from um, our private digital lives. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, whether that's um, uh, ordering, um, you know, uh, a dinner or, um, uh, you know, organising a, a vehicle to come and pick you up or... Um, in many cases, you know, real estate inspections and all sorts of things nowadays that we're doing online. Um, and uh, reduce complexity and, and tell government once. I think that was the key takeaway from Minister Dominello, um, uh, his address. And, uh, you know, uh, that makes life a lot easier for um, the government customers and they get what they need. So um, uh, that's a great segue to um, uh, just reminding you that uh, as a delegate, you will receive um, your Uber Eats lunch voucher via email. Um, if that's not in your inbox, it won't be too far away. And, and uh, sitting through um, um, uh, hearing me um, uh, this afternoon has, has probably been um, uh, certainly enough to, uh, to earn that lunch. So thank you very much. Thanks again to Pega Systems uh, for uh, Pega for our... Um, uh, the event this afternoon, and uh, thank you all um, for staying um, a few minutes over time. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you again. What is the Public Sector Network? Well, technically, it's you, and you, and you, and you. Yes, you too, and you. By participating, connecting and sharing, you are an active part of our global network. As a social enterprise, our goal is to help you save money, save time, reduce waste, share ideas, improve services and help build a diverse and innovative public sector. This is all made possible by a custom-built closed-door portal, which is only accessible with an approved government email address and meets the highest standards of data privacy, security and storage standards. We are committed in helping the public sector improve, which is why our service is completely free for public servants. Sign up today and start unlocking the answers you need. www.publicsectornetwork.co